Hello, this is Brett from Survival Comms. Today on the table we have a couple of directional antennas designed for direction finding and or study of electromagnetic interference, etc. The first antenna is a Yagi style and this antenna is cut for the 700-800 MHz band and is a prototype provided for purposes of testing and evaluation. This antenna was made by a company that is a well-known producer of ham radio Yagi antennas, and I believe this is their first foray into a product made for 700-800 MHz. It was made upon request for our testing and evaluation based upon our project needs, and we'll be doing some of this testing today. This antenna is well constructed of aluminum and it is a seven element Yagi designed for handheld use. It is light in weight at 11 ounces. It features a BNC female RF connector with a gamma match fed driven element. The elements are hollow and element retention to the boom is accomplished with threaded inserts into the element tubes that pass through perforations in the square tubing here. And we'll take it apart so you can see. So you can see how our elements are retained by threading together with threaded rod. And you can see our perforation in the boom here. The boom is plastic capped at both ends. And the hand grip is a foam construction. Again, fit and finish of this product is excellent and it is comfortable to use for its intended role. The feed line provided with this antenna for my testing is four feet or 48 inches of RG58U terminated with an SMA male and a BNC male. Our control antenna for this test is a log periodic printed circuit board antenna made for direction finding and EMC EMI study purposes from 400 megahertz to 6 gigahertz. This antenna is offshore produced and has a retail of less than $50. It features an SMA female RF connector and weight of this antenna with the feed line is 12 ounces. Now the hand grips were produced by myself out of furring strips and Kydex hardware to enhance comfort. The entire antenna, with the exception of the feed point area, has been painted with matte Krylon fusion paint to reduce this antenna's visual signature. And the feed line attached to this antenna is 36 inches of an LMR 195 equivalent terminated with a BNC male and an SMA male connector. Now the first test we're going to do of both of our antennas is SWR sweeps of these antennas in the frequency range of interest. Now let's look at our SWR sweeps of the Yagi antenna as supplied. First of all, we have to consider that we are covering 110 MHz of swept range due to the plus 45 MHz repeater offset at 800 and the minus 30 MHz offset at 700. Now we sweep our log periodic, and no surprise, it is performing as we would expect of an antenna of this design, which is to match and radiate over a wide range of frequencies. Next, we're going to perform a transmit field strength test. We're going to be set up 50 yards away from our location and transmitting with my Apex 8000 connected to our antennas under test towards my spectrum analyzer and measuring the field strength. These are the results from our transmit field strength testing. First up is our Yagi, and you can see our measurement at marker 1 is minus 87.43 decibel milliwatts per square meter. Now this is our log periodic, and the measurement at marker 1 is minus 91.08 decibel milliwatts per square meter. In this test, the Yagi exhibited a gain of 3.65 dB over our log periodic. Now for our next test, we're going to do a close-in signal reception and directivity test between our antennas, and we're going to be using again my spectrum analyzer as a receiver and capturing the data on that. And for our signal source, I'm going to use my signal generator set 50 yards back with a very small antenna at a very low signal level. What you see here is a generated carrier in the 800 megahertz input range. The spectrum analyzer is measuring this signal with the log periodic antenna pointed at it. The RMS value of the signal is in the box highlighted in yellow averaged over 10 sweeps. Now we are pointing 45 degrees right of our signal and this is giving us some idea of the directivity of our antenna under test. Now we move 90 degrees right of our signal and we can see the measurement. 
Now we turn 180 degrees from our signal, meaning we are pointed away from it completely at this time. We now are pointed 90 degrees left of our signal, and one must consider measurements with a handheld antenna can vary between sides presented to the signal due to the interaction of the human body with the antenna. And now we are looking 45 degrees to the left of our signal, and this will be the last measurement in this test of the control antenna. Now let's move on to our test antenna, the Aggie. And this is the data captured, pointed at our signal source. Now 45 degrees right of our signal. Now 90 degrees right of our signal. 180 degrees from our signal. Now 90 degrees left of our signal. Now 45 degrees left of our signal. And this concludes this test of the Aggie antenna. Let's look at our data on the locally generated input test. Now I have placed the results in a graph paper format not that it represents a radiation pattern, but it does place the values captured in a way we can examine relationships in our results. The y-axis is our received signal and the x-axis is indicating the position of the antenna in relation to the signal. Now this is our raw data and it's easy to see how the results are affected by the body's position while holding the antenna. And this is something we're going to go much more in depth on in future content. And I have some really cool props to use for that particular experiment. Now for our results today, we're going to average our data for comparison in this study. And here is our average data. And I average the data because it's very easy to corrupt it by focusing on some random peak and hanging our hat on it. It's like judging the performance of an HF antenna by some incidental contact with Outer Mongolia on 20 meters instead of focusing on consistent repeatable results. So here are two antennas side by side. You know, again, the y-axis received input signal and the x-axis is the relation or the position of the antenna in relation to our target signal. And the center meridian there, 0 and 180 line, represent pointed towards our target signal and directly away from it. And then the 45 and 90 degree positions being left and right of that meridian. And it's clear to see that in this test, the Aggie performance exceeded that of the log in regards to received signal and directivity. The log received a non-target signal of minus 109.12 decibel milliwatts and our Yagi minus 106.90 decibel milliwatts, a 2.2 dB increase in favor of the Yagi. 45 degrees from our target, the log received a signal of minus 112.89 decibel milliwatts and the Yagi minus 113.9. Now when you compare the off-target signal performance to each other, the deviation is minus 3.77 dB for the log and minus 7 dB for the Yagi, which again is decent. At 90 degrees, the log measured the signal as a minus 116.15 decibel milliwatts and the Yagi minus 117.9 decibel milliwatts. And this is minus 7 dB for the log and minus 11 dB for the Yagi. At 180 degrees from signal, the differences were rather minuscule with the log measuring minus 120.4 decibel milliwatts and the Yagi minus 118.64 decibel milliwatts. So the log was up 11.28 dB down from a zero degree signal and the Yagi 11.74 dB down. Now we're going to perform a distance signal reception and directivity test between our two antennas under test utilizing the spectrum analyzer and this is a signal we're going to use as a non-simulcast trunking control channel. Now we're going to be using an external attenuator for some of our testing today and many people are going to be curious as to why I would want to do that. Well when you're trying to ascertain direction of a radio signal in the presence of a strong signal it's very easy to for the receiver to be overloaded and the antenna is really not going to give you any reliable feedback and we kind of see that in some cases where you don't get the front to back in a Yagi antenna because it's receiving so much signal and external attenuator addresses that. Now my 
Spectrum Analyzer has an internal attenuator that I can go through the menu, but I'm old and I prefer a switch on my equipment to going through the menus. The antenna we're going to use for this demonstration is a little lambda loop I put together today out of some shot firing wire, a tongue depressor, solder, and a old RG58 jumper that I chopped the end off of. And this makes a pretty effective little direction finding antenna that doesn't cost much at all to make. So let's go ahead and demonstrate. Right now our attenuator is on zero. Let's turn our receiver on. And you can hear our control channel signal. And you can see that regardless of position of our loop antenna, that our receiver is oversaturated with signal. So this isn't going to provide us any kind of direction finding capability at all. But when we apply attenuation, let's go ahead and get 20 dB. You can hear we're losing our signal. And picking it up again. Right there is our signal. Now, a loop antenna is bi-directional, meaning it's going to give you direction, both directions. So in order to narrow it down, if this is all you have, you just use your body to shield the loop and in the opposite direction. And you can see we're pointed in the direction of radiation or the direction of signal and my body is shielding the antenna. And as we turn back around again, we've established a primary direction. Now to seal the deal, what we'll do is, is we'll just go ahead and put our edge on our target, and that's a null detector. And then you just adjust yourself for the null, and it's a little more precise. There's our null right in that direction there. Here's a display of our instrument performing our testing, and you can see even with 20 dB of attenuation, we still have a respectable signal. You will note the signal is also modulated, so it is occupying more bandwidth than our earlier test. It is hard to find a constant carrier, moderately distant signal at 7-800 MHz that isn't simulcast here to test on, so we will grin and bear it. Now the density of the signal is going to make it difficult to establish much of a directivity analysis while keeping this content visually interesting. If we were to desire to DF this signal, we would attenuate the signal where only a small indication of the signal would be indicated on our instrument display, and this would give us a good idea of initial direction for further study. For the off-target direction, you would only be looking at a noise floor with a numerical value of channel power within the ability of the instrument to resolve it. For the purposes of our test today, we're going to minimize attenuation so we can see a level of directivity that we can actually measure to a degree. Of course, we'll average these results and discuss them after this. Now here are the results of our test, and again, you can see the body's effect on our signal measurements in the raw data. One thing that should be immediately clear is that our log periodic from a terminal gain standpoint is superior to the Yagi in this test. The match of the Yagi at system output frequencies is not good, as we saw earlier, and this is what is playing a role here. So the next time someone tells you that match doesn't matter in a receive role, you can see the evidence to the contrary here. There is almost a 4.6 dB increase in terminal gain over our Yagi, and that was surprising. The directivity measurements of this signal aren't too different from one another, with the Yagi showing marginally superior directivity north of 90 degrees, but again, the signal density is hampering our ability to measure it as clearly as we saw in our local input signal test, and for this I apologize. When we look at our front to back, we have to consider that the forward performance of the log was so much greater than that of the Yagi, and if one was to use this antenna as it sits right now in a direction finding role, the null at 180 degrees with the log would be much more evident than that of the Yagi. Well, this has been an interesting test, to say the least, and I spent far longer doing so than I had envisioned originally. You know, this Yagi works well in the input range, 
but I was shocked at how well the El Cheapo log periodic did against it in the 800 megahertz output range. In the input range where it's cut for, it did outperform the log periodic in terms of directivity and gain, but the difference in output range really surprised me. And it surprised me so much that it had me questioning my methodology, and I wonder if there's some flaw in the equipment. And I changed up just about every potential variable, including location, but the results were consistent all the time. You know, I really enjoy making this sort of content for you, and I hope you enjoyed watching it. I hope this helps. This is Brett from Survival Comms. Till next time.